Welcome back. How you folks doing? That's not gonna do it. How you folks doing? Awesome, all right, we're in the home stretch. This is an amazing segment. I'm Gary Bowles, I'm the chair for the future of work with Singularity University. And what that means is I get to go to places like cocktail parties, tell people my, uh, my title, and have them ask me, will robots and software take all of our jobs? Will my child have a job in the future? And my response is, well, you know, that's actually one potential future of work. And as we had just looked at the headlines nowadays, that's all you'll see, is that the zero-sum mentality about our technologies overtaking all the tasks that humans do, eventually there's just going to be a shrinking circle of work for humans. Now, if you take Ray Kurzweil's view that the future is better than you think, then there's a second future of work, and that's where we have actually switched the calculus We've actually decided to take all of these disruptive technologies, these exponential technologies that are transforming our world and our lives, and we've turned them on ourselves to help us to all develop superpowers. But there's a third future of work, and what the data shows right now is that it's probably not completely that dystopian future. It's probably not that completely utopian future. It's actually that the two exist simultaneously that there's all of this amazing work, all of these problems to be solved that each of us will be able to focus on if we have the ability to continually transition to solving the work of tomorrow. And what I've become convinced over a couple of years of focusing on these issues, traveling the world, talking to unlimited number of people is that our deliverable today, working together, is not an answer. If we all came up with what we thought was the answer to the future of work today, we'd be wrong tomorrow. It's a process. We need to discuss the ways in which we continually adapt, the strategies that we need to use today that allow us to build that more positive future tomorrow. So I'd like to invite my two guests up to join me to be able to discuss what those strategies could be and how we could create that positive future together. Please help me in welcoming Stefan Casriel from Upwork and Kelly Stevenways from here. Welcome to our new home. Yeah. All right, so I've already warmed them up for you. Everybody's ready to, to hear what you have to say. So um, the two of you, each of you from different lenses has been focused on the world of work for quite some time. You, you've developed a thesis, I guess, of some of the things that could make you hopeful and some of the things that concern you. So I'm actually gonna start off with Kelly. What's one or two things that make you really positive about the future of work? And what's one or two things that freak you out? So what I'm most excited about is that we really have an opportunity to create the future um, and live in this abundance mindset, um, that we can point human beings towards work that's more meaningful by leveraging all the technology that we have today for some of the insights about their skills, their aspirations, and if we can really match that, uh, we can create phenomenal experiences, jungle gym careers, as I call them, people that have this portfolio of experiences. And then we can come together and, and really solve some big problems for the world. I guess what scares me is when I look at the trifecta of GDP at its lowest level, unemployment at a 50-year low, particularly in the US, but globally, unemployment is low, and the fact that engagement still rests on low double digits. This is a real problem for us that if we don't solve this, and the fact that if we don't, if we embrace this scarcity mindset versus abundance, that we're gonna leave so many people behind, and we will have moments like we had in Detroit where we just you know, decimate a whole city in terms of, of economic value. So I see that's, that's sort of what scares me, Gary. Okay, great. Stefan, how about you? Well, I'm an optimist, so let me start with the scary part and then we can end on the more positive <laughs> part. Right, okay. I would say the scary part to me is the doom and gloom scenario that makes the headlines. So the idea you know, that you mentioned, the, the scenario where essentially we become the slaves of the robots or the, the cattle and the pets of the robots and you know, what Yuval Harari calls the useless class where the vast majority of the population is underemployed or unemployed, living on universal basic income and essentially pretty desperate. And I think the reason why that story is really damaging because it, it could be self-fulfilling. 
if you truly believe there is no future, then why would you invest in building a better future? And so the risk is we talk about something that is extremely unlikely to happen, and then we make it happen despite ourselves. And that really scares me. I would say the optimist in me, um, you know, this is a conference about exponential, and technology is exponential, but humans are not. And so what's going to happen is, you know, when I grew up, when you were writing computer code, you'd be writing it on a piece of paper, and people would help you debug it on the piece of paper, because the machine was expensive and humans were cheap. And that, that time is gone. Machine computing power is infinite. Uh, data is infinite. And the thing that hasn't evolved all that much is humans. And what that means is we've become the scarce resource. And when a resource is scarce, you take care of it a lot more. So the, the hopeful side of me thinks we're going to put the human at the center. We're going to uh, you know, allow people to do the things that they're really good at and outsource to the machines the 3Ds, you know, the dangerous, dirty, and demeaning jobs. And we're going to allow people to work from wherever they want and have more flexibility in their life. And, you know, that's going to make people more fulfilled. And so I think there is a scenario, but we need to figure out how we get there, where it ends up working out much better than it works today. So I think you, you, we all share this sort of uh, cautious optimism. Um, uh, but here, here are some of the challenges that I see. So uh, first off, uh, you're right, it, it may not be a likely future, but the truth is so much of the way that we think about innovation, the way that we fund innovation, it's about 10xing things. And that normally means doing things at a tenth the cost of messy, expensive humans or more. Yeah. And so um, that the first dystopian future that I was talking about, Silicon Valley actually is kind of dancing in the end zone or, or between the goalposts, right? We, you know, we won, messy, expensive humans lost, and, uh, and we made all the money. So... <laughs> But the truth is, uh, robots and software don't take jobs, humans give them away. They're, they're, so leaders and organizations, they're the ones that are making these decisions about what you automate. So Kelly, you've been in a range of different types of organizations. And so, so tell me about some of those rational decisions. And do you think there's any particular characteristics of organizations that are building that more inclusive future or more prepared for that type of future? So I think there's uh, three characteristics that I think are important uh, for organizations. I think being adaptable, building adaptable workforces that are fluid, um, having some humility, uh, knowing that in this sharing economy that we don't have to invent everything in our own organization, that through partnerships we actually can do things exponential. Um, and then I think being resourceful, uh, to be innovative and creative takes some resourcefulness. I think that we have insights now to jobs that are going to be automated. We have the insights to get in front of this and to reskill and upskill and to give people choice in, in the direction they're headed. So I think we can, we can make a difference in this capacity going forward. And do you think that's going to change the calculus around engagement that you were talking about? I mean, the truth is we've got this, so I call them the old rules of work, this traditional model of engagement between an organization and a worker. The, the organization said, yeah, I'm going to give you a job for a long period of time. And the worker said, yeah, I'm going to give you my loyalty for a long period of time. So that starts to erode. So now is the new contract, is it something along the lines of we will continue to help you to adapt and to do the work of tomorrow? And, and, I, and how do you get fund that? Like, how do you justify yeah. the cost of that? I think that it's about giving people a more personalized, customized experience. Um, and we've done that at Here Technologies. We actually built a platform that opened up an internal marketplace where we could visualize their skills. They actually have a very personalized profile. And we use machine learning and artificial intelligence to match them. So we're actually democratizing um, that uh, work. We're giving them more choice. And I think by doing so, we create that loyalty because we're giving people the opportunity to bring their whole selves to work, um, which is something we haven't done in the past. We've really seen people in more of a myopic view under you know, a job and a title. Okay. So, so I want to continue on that, that contract, and especially from the organization's perspective. So, Stefan, you, you've chosen to be the CEO of a newly public company. You've got 2,000 employees, but 75% of them are not traditional employees. They're actually workers, independent workers, on your contract. And when I tell other CEOs that, their, their eyes roll up and they start to sweat because the idea that you would have a bunch of people working for and with you who could walk away tomorrow terrifies them. So how do you think about that process and what do you do differently 
to be able to keep that engagement. Yeah, so you know, the myth of uh, people are going to stay with you for a long time because they have an employment contract with you, like even if that's legally yeah. and technically true, that's the engagement problem, right? I mean, if people stay because they have to, as opposed to they, will, they want to, they may, they may not be giving the best of themselves and it may not be additive to the company. So, you know, I would say the, the short answer is treat people the way you'd like to be treated, right? I mean, if somebody is an employee, you want to be their, their employer of choice. If somebody is a freelancer, you want to be their client of choice. And frankly, the minute details of how you do this might be somewhat different, but the fundamental concept is still the same, which is give people meaning. Give them something that they you know, can contribute to, something that where they can show their skills, they can improve their skills over time, um, and treat them like, you know, they are part of the, the team, they are core to what you do. Don't treat them like a vendor that you're trying to squeeze and pay as late as possible and all sorts of other things that people tend to do with uh, their traditional vendors. And then what you'll find is some of the most loyal people that will work at your company are not your full-time employees that come from 9 to 5 and come on site for a very simple reason, which is your local labor market is incredibly, I mean, talk about non-exponential. It's, yeah, right. it's the pool that everybody is fighting for. And meanwhile, you've got this you know, huge population in the US and worldwide of people that are typically not being addressed by the local job market. You know, the, about 50% of freelancers in the US say they cannot take a traditional full-time job. And it's people that have disabilities, people that have care duties, and people that live in a part of the country where there's essentially fundamentally no good jobs for them. And you get access to that talent pool. If you treat them well on top of that, you're, they're going to be with you for life. So I think it's a great thought experiment for any of you who are leaders or even managers in organizations. It's just to try to imagine if you had this type of environment where every single person that worked for you, it was a daily renewed contract that you would be working together. I think that's just a, a mind-blowing process. But the thing that I worry about when I talk about... Uh, two-sided work markets, which is, you know, is a lot of what you have, is that there's always three components. There's uh, demand, that's, that's the customer. There's uh, the platform, and then there's supply, us mess, messy, expensive humans. And what ends up happening a lot is that the platform and the demand wins, and then there's actually downward compression on wages on the supply. So how do you help to create the kinds of conditions where not just the ones with the highest demand skills win, but in the world you're talking about where more and more people, especially at disadvantage, yeah. need work, how do you help them to be able to thrive? You know, I think one thing that's absolutely critical when you run a for-profit company is to make sure that you build your business model to be aligned with the the, the, the interest of your community. So in our case, we do something that most economists would say is not profit maximizing, which is we operate on a cost plus basis. Right. So we make more money when freelancers make more money, and therefore it's in totally selfishly in our best interest, but not by coincidence, that we have every incentive to make sure that freelancers can be as successful and making as much money as they can on the platform. Yeah. The, the example, if you want to see it, how this can go wrong, is Etsy, the work market, or the um, crafts market platform. When it went public, it got a new set of investors that basically kicked out management and raised the prices on the supply. Mm -hmm. And so this is, the, I think, the challenge, and it sounds like you've put in the heuristics in the design of the platform to be able to ensure that it actually you know, is much more inclusive of humans. So Kelly, I want to go back to what you were talking in terms of the, the process by which helping people within an organization to match their skills to work opportunity. Um, and I'll be talking tomorrow, for instance, with uh, Sean Hinton from SkyHive, which has another kind of approach to that kind of matching process. My concern in a world where more and more AI is helping to do that is agency on the part of humans. If we just build better Harry Potter sorting hat functions, then I don't know that humans are, you know, if we just tell humans, yeah, that's the, the slot that you're most meant for without the agency that's involved. So how do you help people to become really agentful in that kind of process? So we're seeing kind of what's the one thing that you struggle with as, as a manager, right? You, you're managing work and you're managing people and what tends to give is the managing people part. So one of the things that we've ex we're experimenting at here is thinking of more of this talent coach, this agent for the people that's really focused on their career path, knowing their skills, curating a lot of the opportunities, both in the project-based work environment internally or that gig inside environment that we have, and also full-time 
opportunities. And using the machine or sort of the AI piece of this really for insights. You don't take the human being completely out, but you start to divide these roles so that you can actually spend more quality time on just focused on someone's career and their path versus, and we all know we can get to the same path uh, or the same role from a different path. We can take our individual path. So that's kind of some of the things that we're experimenting with. It's not the machine that takes over. It's actually that man and machine working together yeah. for the best possible outcome. So it sounds kind of like the Stitch Fix model, you know, the, the company that you can basically get um, subscription clothing sent to you every month and AI is supplementing a designer that is continually helping to be, and it's, it's not one or the other, and it's certainly not a partnership. I don't think of us partnering with our technology. I think of it as augmenting and enhancing us, but it may, just helps you to make better decisions as a human. So, uh, but I want to play off of what you just said, because part of it to me, you, um, that sounds like that's an HR professional. And, um, and there's a lot of talk nowadays from the organizational perspective about what is the role of HR and how do you, uh, back in the, the early 90s, I uh, ran technology magazines like Network Computing, and the discussion back then was strategic IT. And I would tell CIOs all the time, well, you can't be really strategic if you have all of this massive technology you have to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. So what is strategic HR? What is that function? in an exponential organization. I mean, you project down the road, how do you transform that part of the organization so that's actually helping humans to thrive? So you're, I, I see the CHRO role as fundamentally changing. We have to become more of the COO of what I call the talent supply chain. So in supply chain methodology, if your inventory goes below your de demand, uh, you can't actually um, f meet that need. And, and much like uh, in, um, in HR, you know, our job is to make sure that our company has those critical skills that we need to meet the demand. Otherwise, we cannot ex execute our strategy. Yeah. So the role is, I think, really uh, to make sure that we have access to those critical talent pools that we're looking for, that we can create more supply even from the inside, because let's face it, there's only so many data scientists, there's only so many AI engineers to go after. So we have to actually take control of that supply. So that's kind of how I see the role changing. It's much more at the table around business and making sure those human capital strategies are, are going to help you execute the ultimate business strategy for the company. So Stefan, with, with, with your structure, with the way you're dealing with your workers, it sounds like it's a much more flexible, like a very flexible work environment. Mm -hmm. How do you think about that process of helping people to be able to match up to the work that they're doing? And, and it, is, it, is it as dynamic as it sounds that you've got this sort of continually changing group of workers? Or do you have people that are actually loyal and longtime workers that want to stay on the platform? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people that are, you know, doing the same work remotely, you know, year in and year out. And then there are people that come in, you know, on demand based on what, what is needed at the time. Yeah, I think fundamentally there's two approaches. One is top down and command and control. And you need to have really good IT systems to be able to predict, you know, to your point about the supply chain, like predict the needs of the organization in terms of every single skill. And if you think it's hard to manage a supply chain of retail SKUs, a supply chain of humans where everybody seems to be unique is even harder. Um, I think the approach that works better for us is much more of a bottoms up type of approach where we have uh, you know, clear strategy at the top, but then we let teams figure out what they actually need in order to be successful. And essentially, you know, my role is to be an investor, if, if you will. I have a budget. I uh, listen to people pitching on different ideas. We give them funding, and then they go figure out how to build it. Right. So, but doesn't that take a, just a different mindset? I mean, a different way of thinking? Now you've got this portfolio of workers. You've got a portfolio of problems. Yeah. And, but you're basically giving up a whole bunch of control to assume that that's all going to work out. How do you, what's the structure in which those people all work together? Yeah, I would, you know, so let me give you kind of a counter to this. So I, I used to work at a very big traditional software company and they were playing the game of Tetris every day. So they have big PMOs whose job is to try to align internal resources in the company that are fixed in the short term. There's nothing you could do to hire more people. And if you had people that you didn't really need, there was nothing you could do to keep them busy. Boxes are just going to keep on falling. Yeah, so, and yeah. Then, then on the other side, you had needs. And even that, you know, we're talking about this earlier, like deconstructing work in terms of skills is something that most traditional companies struggle with. So yeah. 
You have people, you don't quite know what they're capable of, and you have roles, and you don't quite know what they're made up of, and somehow you're supposed to PMO this thing into magic and create, and, and the reality of it, that's why a lot of big companies are struggling right now, because skills are changing faster than ever before, people need more flexibility, and the way organizations operate has not kept up, right? And so, What's driving the change in the workforce today, at least you know, the, the freelancer movement, which is the, the part that we are a part of, is not big companies. It's small startups that see a need to operate very differently, and it's the individuals themselves, people that are raising their hands saying, this craziness of having to commute to the office for two hours every day. Like, Americans spend more time in their car driving to the office than time on vacation, right? Yeah. And it's getting worse every year. So the, the craziness for the individual is what's driving the change. People are saying, look, I don't need to be in the office to do the work that I do, and I don't need to commit to a single company, and I definitely don't do my best job from nine to five. So give me the freedom and flexibility of working differently. And the companies that embrace that will get the best talent. They will be more competitive, because talent is the, the key to success in most organizations these days. And companies that you know, resist the change and don't want to experiment are the ones that ultimately are going to be at a competitive disadvantage. And I totally agree with that because I think that, you know, there, we all grew up or many of us grew up in a work environment where we had control, right? We, we got 50 people, we've got X number of hours, we've got X number of funding, and we have to make that work. And so this whole idea of letting go of all that, um, and then certainly in our platform, it's talent sharing across organizational boundaries. Now we're talking about talent sharing in our ecosystem, partners and customers, and that just seems like a loss of control. So we have to step out of, and I've, I've had to do a lot of work in the last two years to get leaders out of a mindset that command and control and hierarchy is the way forward, at, that the way forward is teams uh, coming together, self-directed towards one mission, set the mission and clarity and let them go. And we've had great, we've saved over almost 20 million euro um, over the last two years in this new way of working. And if, when I first sat down with these leaders, I said, this is gonna be complete chaos. There's no way that's gonna work. And these are the ones that once they got on board, really started to adopt this way of working. Right. And I think that um, if we're gonna be six, if we're really gonna make exponential change in the future of work, we're going to have to adopt this way of working. And this mindset, it's a mindset. So for organizations, for people who are going through this transition, the, the, thing that I, the question I often hear is, well, where do I start? Mm -hmm. like, so how do you help someone with a more traditional organization or when it's a really big organization, how can you be a change maker? That, and, and what would you do? Like, how would you help them to be able to start to transition to this more open mindset? Any thoughts? You know, I think you start with uh, people that are excited about the change as opposed to people that are resisting the change. And in every company, there are people that are excited to do things differently. Yeah, we call it a coalition of the willing. Yeah. yeah. And so you start with that. Then you do the easy stuff. And I would say, like, one very easy thing is you find people in your company, in your team, that would like to move even temporarily in a totally different part of the country so that they experience what it's like to work remotely. They'll give you plenty of feedback on how poorly you operate with the remote team members. Right. So you'll improve, and these are people that already have your trust, and they'll be able to convince you to change a lot more. And then you start to do the same thing with your contingent workers, you know, the, the individual, uh, you know, I, the independent contractors that come to your office every day, tell them that they can work from home and they can work from a couple of hundred miles away from here. You know, not everybody needs to live in San Francisco in order to be able to help with your company. And then document, you know, like this is working, prove it to the rest of the organization and start to expand it from there. And we've seen it, you know, at this stage, our, our largest customers have something around 2,500 to 3,000 people that are essentially full-time equivalent on Upwork working for them day in, day out. Yeah. And, you know, the reason why that happens is because they started small, they measured success, they proved to themselves that it wasn't going to you know, destroy their DNA and their culture, and they didn't own the talent anymore. They just had access to the talent, and they get comfortable with it, and then you know, they keep doing it more and more. Yeah. What about you, Kelly? So for 
here technologies, it was about putting talent mobility at the center of our strategy and then building a foundation where we disrupted the way we looked at performance management, the way we do succession planning. We, we don't look at boxes and charts and try to see who is the person for this exact job. We talk about their skills. We talk about what they might need to learn. We talk about talent pools and domains of skills that are most important to us. So we talk about, we get to talk about the broad brush of all people that might be uh, available to take that next role based upon their skill set. So we fundamentally changed the conversation. Um, and then I, I had this very interesting talk with senior leaders about what I call delicious ambiguity. And, and how to embrace this more abundant view of the world. And it was very interesting and insightful. And a lot of it was based in fear and, and, and fear that, that I won't be able to predict the outcome. Right. <laughs> and so I think we're doing a lot of work at here around building great talent architects and making that a part of the leadership journey. And what do I mean by that? I mean by uh, building flexible work models. And this is the about taking that baby step towards letting go, that maybe I might be able to get someone from the outside in a gig to come in and handle this piece of work, teaching them how to break down work from a traditional job into units or services and what skills I need for that. So there's, it, it's, it's a journey yeah. to change mindsets. Now, as we talk about a lot of this sort of what, what John Hagel often calls unbundling of the organization and what I call unbundling of work, um, what, it, what ends up happening is that old uh, contract, that old agreement, one person, one job, and so on, as we erode a lot of that, we have all these you know, really different characteristics of work. Uh, what I worry about is that, uh, and what I think the data is starting to show, is that you, you really do have some people that benefit really well and others that are trying to adapt to this new way of work. But the difficulty is that actually it, it, it's without a steady paycheck. Instead, what you get is precarity. You get this, you know, this constant, you know, so in the United States, I'm sure we all know the statistics, you know, 40% uh, of people say a single $400 unexpected bill just completely whacks them out, means they can't pay the rent the next month. And so... How do you think about the strategies, the ways in which as more and more workers are working in non-traditional roles, non-traditional ways without that stability, how do we create the kind of environment that allows them to be able to continue to thrive and have some level of stability and predictability? Any thoughts about how we fix that? Yeah, I mean, you know, and it, the answer is it depends on the country, right? Okay. So I, I spend a lot of time on uh, working with the World Economic Forum. And it's very clear that every country has a history and what works for Switzerland and what works for Germany is not going to be what works for the US. Um, but that being said, fundamentally, the social contract of the 21st century cannot be the same as the social contract of the 19th century. We're in a you know, post-industrial world. And assuming that people are going to get all of the benefits from their employer who's going to see them all the way from you know leaving school to retirement and they get the gold watch is just not going to happen and so what that means is you need to unbundle things that were coming with the full-time job the w2 in the us or the equivalent in other country needs to be offered by other parts of society and in some countries unions can step up and have a bigger role in some countries the government can step up and have a bigger role in some countries it's the individuals that step up and it really depends on the context but fundamentally uh, the future is not a replication of the past. So the idea that we're going to go back to the good jobs of the 1950s and 1960s is extremely unhelpful as a solution to the problem. We really need to get ahead of it. Lifelong learning is a key part of it. The idea that what you know today is only half as valuable five years from now is extremely critical for people to internalize because if you don't reskill yourself regularly, then you will be left behind. Uh, but when people do struggle, you know, reinventing the social safety net. Tom Friedman has this really good expression where he says, the safety net is a terrible metaphor. What we need to create is a social trampoline. Because the safety right. net, you fall in yeah. it and you're stuck. And the trampoline, you're going to bounce off of. So how do we create funding so that you can reskill yourself without feeling, oh my god, I, I need to do five shifts for the job. And on top of that, I need to go to college at the same time. There's no possible way I can do that. So how do you give people enough um, funding enough flexibility that they can rescale themselves throughout their life and continue to be you know, thriving in the economy. Yeah, I, I often say that sort of the reductionist view is uh, that you know, the two questions it sort of boils down to is, are we going to help humans to continually be relevant and learn, or are we going to fix the system? 
And the answer is yes, both. you have both. to do, you yeah. must do both. Right. Because if we don't help people to continually adapt, then they won't be able to do the work of tomorrow. And if we don't change the dynamics of the system, then they won't have the level of reliability and stability that they've had in the past. Yeah, and we had an interesting discussion about resilience. I think one of the things that I'm about to send my oldest to college, and I think the area that we really need to disrupt is academia, because the world is not going to be fixed. You, you know, we, we study, we get accounting degree, and then we go and do accounting for the rest of our career. Not necessarily. It's not fixed. And so we have to teach um, these young people to be resilient, to be their own brand. So if they're going to go and they're going to work on the Upwork platform and, and have multiple sources of revenue or be an Uber driver part-time and have, have this income that's coming at all different ways, they need to learn to be their own brand and be adaptable and resilient. And I'm not sure that's something that we're teaching today. No, I, I call this this uh, you know, variety of different elements of work, I call that a portfolio of work, right? Because exactly. that's a, increasingly, you know, parents ask me all the time, why won't my kid get a real job? And the answer is it's a, uh, it's a rational response to an exponentially changing world. If yeah. you don't think you're going to have that stable work, then you're going to essentially assemble it and on an ongoing basis. And, and unfortunately, we've created an educational system that has just failed our kids to this point to be able to prepare them for it. So I, so I give you guys, just to, to close our, our discussion, got tons more questions, but uh, the time clock is screaming at me. Uh, what, I give you a magic wand. You wave, wave your magic wand and you change one thing about the dynamics of the system. You know, Ray Kurzweil you know, is, is fond of saying, you know, basically AI is going to infuse more and more of the work that we do. Software is going to actually interpolate so much of the, the work that we perform. What, how do you change that? dynamic, so we guarantee no human let gets left behind. What, what, what's, the, what's the magic wand uh, decision, either of you? Oh, wow. If we only get one, I'm not totally sure. Like, I have probably 10 right now. I would okay. say, if I only got one, I would say um, companies will need to revisit the idea that maximizing shareholder value is their sole purpose in life. Because ultimately, the reason why lifelong learning is not happening at the rate at which it's happening is because for a lot of companies, the solution is simple. Take a bunch of workers that are no longer have the skills that you need, fire them, dump them on society, replace them with other workers that have the skills that you need. And of course, pretty obviously, if everybody does it, which is kind of what's happening today, then nobody's investing in reskilling. And that's fundamentally what's happening in a lot of countries, definitely very visible in the US right now. I think increasingly, and you saw this yesterday, the, the Business Roundtable, which is this association of the biggest CEOs in North America, finally revisited this idea uh, that the sh sole purpose of the corporation is to maximize shareholder value and instead think about multi-stakeholder value, think about externalities that you create. And whether it's climate change or lifelong learning, these are things that we as business leaders have a deep responsibility for, if not individ individually, at least collectively. Yeah. Absolutely. So sorry, Kelly, really, really briefly. Yeah, and I, I will expand Magic that it's just the, ri it's the rise of the social enterprise, right? Deloitte had the study about this, that people don't trust government anymore. They're looking to corporations to make some of these uh, dramatic changes that can impact society in exponential ways. And I think it's up to us to create that future and to use technology for good. And to put the to to lose our leave our egos at the door, bring the br best brilliant minds together to solve some of these big issues, and change the mindset so that we are open to letting go of control and tapping into human potential that we have because we have so much of it. Oh. And on that note, we're out of time. I want to uh, help me thank our guests here, and I hope you all have a, an exponential future of work. Thank you. So, great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, that was an amazing panel.